ladies and gentlemen, I now present the teams for the 1991 Grand Final. This country of ours is divided today. The West Coast Eagles, after five years, have made it through to their first Grand Final, and they're up against the experienced old stages, Hawthorne. It's life-changing. You win a Grand Final, you're part of history forever. You lose a Grand Final, scarred for life. At some stage, we've got to take on the big bully. This is our moment. We've got to take these boys on. Yeah, superbly done once more. We didn't know if we were going to win it, but we knew we were going to give it one hell of a shake. You don't get handed out premierships. You know, I think success comes without comfort. And the club pretty much went into a crisis. Winning wasn't expected at Hawthorne, it was demanded. What a grand final. The two heavyweights in the competition are slugging it out. There was an intense rivalry because we didn't want to give up our throne, but they wanted it. For me, I was dirty. I was dirty on a few of my teammates. The expectation from the WA public was massive. The mantra was thrown around, too old, too slow. Take them on, it's 20 men versus 25,000 today. I was livid, and I am still livid. If you're going to lose a grand final, it's probably better not to be in one. Setbacks in life can become your greatest opportunities. I would hate to think what life would have been like if I hadn't have played in that grand final. The city that stunned the world with its audacious and successful raid on the America's Cup in the 80s is at it again. Out to shake the sporting establishment and snare the symbol of football supremacy. The landmark had changed in the competition. It wasn't a Victorian run competition anymore. I wanted the club to be desperately part of the AFL. And when I first got across there, it felt as if it was AFL and West Coast. We never felt a part of it. Coming back to Perth, you had 35,000 people clapping and you know, patting you on the back. When you went to Victoria, you'd be lucky to have 35 people. The WA public were right on board and riding that pioneering sort of feel that we had at that moment. We're only a young club, we're only five years old. We're playing against a club that's you know, got 80 years tradition. That football club had been the pace setter for so many years. And they had a trophy cabinet, they had silverware, we had nothing. They dominated the 70s and set new marks in toughness and endurance in the 80s. Now Hawthorne moves into a new era, ready to take on the young challenge. We were that great team that had been through a fantastic era that was just clinging by a thread. The pressure to stay there. 91 was enormous. You expected to win, you expected to play finals, you expected to win premierships. Hawthorne has played in eight of the past nine grand finals. In 90, we missed the grand final and the, and the club pretty much went into a crisis. <laughs> the mantra was thrown around, too old, too slow. The Eagles have been the AFL's dominant team all season and on paper, the flag should be theirs. There were times in the 91 season where I thought we played some of the best football that had ever been played. Here's a new side that's going over there, beating them in their own backyard. We'd come back to Perth and there'd be 5,000 people at the airport. And it was like the Beatles had come back in. It was rock star sort of stuff. We had to take side exits to get to our cars because of mobs of people. I think even Hawthorne would most their players would say we were the best side throughout the season. He's hammered over the line. From rounds 1 to 22, I think the Eagles were just about the best team I've seen. There was an intense rivalry because we didn't want to give up our throne, but they wanted it. We deserve this. These guys have just come along, you know, they're young upstarts. It's history in the making at Subiaco, with the West Coast hosting their first ever final, the qualifying final against Hawthorne. We thought the hardest match of the 91 final series was going to be the qualifying final. The fact that it was the first AFL, VFL final to be played outside of Victoria was a really significant occasion. When we arrived, the atmosphere in Perth was just unbelievable. The Eagles were everywhere in terms of media-wise. And I just remember Mick, he was, he was livid at me. He says, you know, half you bloody blokes are on TV and radio, and he says, you know, get off it and get back, your mind back on the job. It's a carnival atmosphere here in Perth. It's exciting to know that people are behind you. And then on the same hand, you could say, but it does raise the pressure. It was the first time a finals match had ever been played outside Melbourne, and the Perth crowd were treated to football of an amazingly high standard. A 23-point loss stopped them in their tracks. Set up, gets it to Morrissey. They call him the freak, this boy. What can he do? His kick is wide. They call him the freak. 
everyone expected the West Coast to just sort of waltz through and win the game, but look, they were there for a game of footy and had different ideas. second semi-final if the Eagles learned enough to come back later in September. They came in under the radar, got the job done. A lot of people rate as one of the best wins in the history of the club. I always thought in the back of my mind whoever won that was probably going to win the grand final. The media had written us off. You did that at your own peril back in those days. Personally I reckon we had to win that first final against Swarthland. We came away from that game thinking well they can't beat us here. I don't think they can beat us in Melbourne. The Eagles are bringing a squad of 50 players to Melbourne, all hoping to return to Perth with this under their arm. The Eagles' entourage touched down in Melbourne. Not only have they become the first interstate team to make it to the AFL's premier event, the Grand Final, but they also snubbed their noses at Melbourne's traditional Grand Final parade. It was unique just having to be there on your own. They showed all the Hawthorne guys going around and then they showed all these empty cars. It's a little bit embarrassing. We shut down with the media, it just felt like a pressure cooker because we couldn't, we weren't able to speak to everyone, we're walking around on shells. Perhaps the league should have been stronger, said no you've got to be there. We would have grudgingly gone there but it probably would have been for the best. At the foot of the Dandenong Ranges, in the population centre of suburban Melbourne, lies VFL Park, a stadium that will today celebrate its 21st birthday with its proudest moment. That year, the game was played at Waverley, the old VFL Park, the only time in, in history, because the MCG was under uh, redevelopment, so what is now the, the Great Southern Stand was being built. It wasn't quite MCG-like in, in the atmosphere, but it was, it was still the grand final. Well, it was like coaching around about 30 kilometres east of Alice Springs. It was, it was bizarre. It didn't matter for us, it's such a short period of time in the club's history, here we are, we're in one. This is probably the first and last time that this ground will be used for a grand final. The real place for Hawthorne was, it was our home ground. Desolate. Personally, it didn't feel like a grand final. Because out come the West Coast Eagles. I ran out and I was uh, trying to spot my mum in the crowd, which was uh, 75,000 people there. You stop and pinch yourself and say, this is, this is it. This is your first grand final. Hawthorne are making their way out onto the ground. And again, a huge draw. Gary has stopped the whole side in the race as we're all marching down, getting ready to run through the banner. The message was loud and clear. These guys are in our way, let's, let's knock them over. Trying to outstare the bloke across from you. I'm listening to Daryl Braithwaite doing the anthem, a bit of a fan, so we've sort of got one eye on him and one eye across the road. So stare him in the eye, I couldn't do it. I felt it was so, such an affront that I knew if he stared me back, I'd want to punch them. <laughs> well, it's been worth waiting for, hasn't it, five years ago, and here they are, the West Coast Eagles in a grand final great for the national competition. That was our first big dance. We were under no illusions how hard it was going to be. There's a fear that it might be a last row. It's just about wanting the game to start. The next two hours are the most important part of your footballing journey. Just a few words that describe what you're thinking before a grand final, and it is just whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I was livid, and I am still livid. As far as I was concerned, he was the most maligned player at the Hawthorne Footy Club. A quiet opening to the match was notable for two undisciplined acts by one of the game's most disciplined defenders. Oh, but is that 50? Yes. There's a gate slang, but you can see that. I think he wanted to make a statement. He's going to make it hard for me throughout the day. You know, he could kick a fair goal from outside 50, so he didn't have to bring him any closer. <laughs> so Sumix to kick the first score of the game, and surely it'll be a goal from the square. Familiar side drop punt straight through. And you think, OK, well, if you made one mistake, don't make a second one. And, uh, you know, what can I say? And inside the attacking 50, Sumix on the lead. It's 50 again. Chris Langford, twice now. I was livid, and I am still livid. Langers doesn't do that. Chris Langford doesn't give away undisciplined 50-metre penalties. The night before 91, I went up to JB Hi-Fi, bought this CD and went home, turned it up full ball, and I, I got myself just too razzed up, and and I, I always blame myself that, you know, I shouldn't have bought that, to listen to that music. There's the infringement, there's Hedy's. Boy, are oh, 
these costly penalties. It'll be cold. Sonic Temple. Full ball. <laughs> Point blank range. Goal. Top of the world. I was just pumped. He might have been making a statement on me, but then I felt like, well, I've got this bloke. Past the centre circle, chip passes intended for Servich, and what a good thing it was, honouring a great lead. He was almost the spiritual leader of our forward line. We knew if he was up and going, gee, we were up and going. I liked him when he you know, got the ball 50 yards out on the, on the flank rather than 30 yards out directly in front, because he'd always kick those big long ones with his hooking style. Started well, already has two. Great kick. That year, he had an unbelievable year somewhere. 111.89. So if my maths is correct, that's 200 shots a goal. Someone's still the best right foot, left footer that I've ever seen play. He didn't really like running as such. And he didn't really like stretching. <laughs> I don't think he ever touched his toes. Well, it might have been a slow start for West Coast, but suddenly they're two goals in front. I remember thinking, gee, he's off to a good start. He looked like early on he might just kick him to a winning score. Hudson sits and makes, back turns, gets away, chips a little left foot or a good one. Good shot. I was the youngest member, being 21, of the grand final side. Strong tackle by a couple of Hawthorne players, Hudson's left foot to half forward. People would look at it and go, well, you've got a nut game because of your name. Just drifting out of the centre, like he could kick a goal like no one else. Inside the attacking 50, Hudson. 17 votes in the Brownlow on Monday, and of course his dad played in Hawthorne's 71 Premiership team. I wasn't thinking 20 years and and what dad had experienced because he couldn't remember the 1971 Grand Final. I'd love a dollar for every time. You're not going to be as good as your old man, and and I I conceded that that might be the case. He had some tricks, hello. Still reckon I might have passed more to him than he passed to me. I had a lot of time for Paul Hudson. He as far as I was concerned, he was the most maligned player at the Hawthorne Footy Club. I don't know why. In front of Jakovic. Who wins the tap. Wilson runs onto it, kicks the ball to goals. With bouncing, bouncing. Oh, up. no! For goal! Three goals to zero. Long drop punt, leans back, kicks it well. Right there. Another one. Well, we were up and about in the first five minutes. I thought... We're a Monty here, um, that we'll win this. My overall feeling was we're in deep trouble. They're running rings around us. Chance behind for Dia, open goal and sits for him and he kicks it. But I think by halfway that first quarter we'd turn the game around. One of the things Joycey said prior to the game was that if he could get ten goals out of Dermot and myself, we'd win the game. Ball goes to ground, Dia's handball pretty good. Alan to Dunstall, good kick. Good mark by Dunstall under good pressure. Well, Brennan kept Dunstall just to three goals last time they played on one another. You know, I enjoyed playing on Jason. Uh, you, know, you always knew it was going to be a tough day. He kicked a lot of goals and, gee, he also you know, dished off a few too. For an utterly selfish bloke, he was a very unselfish player. <laughs> Damn it. <sighs> to kick better than Condon. Drop punt. Goal. And what a handy one in the last 30 seconds of the first quarter. That's amazing, I didn't notice the Dunstall cardboard cutout. <laughs> they must have been big though. <laughs> they were abominable things, those things. Cardboard personality actually in the real body. What's the difference? 15 seconds, Dunstall again. A good kick, free kick. Free kick in the last minute of this first quarter, West Coast would have fancied themselves going in three or four goals up. Can Dunstall repeat the effort from 20 seconds ago? Drop punt, he's kicked it well again for another one. Well, the Hawks have got out of jail here as the siren sounds. I do know in my own heart that we didn't have a big enough lead at quarter time. Those last two goals by Dunstall were critical. There was certainly no feeling that uh, that's going to dictate the result of the game. Came in at quarter time and looked at the scoreboard and thought, we're a fair way behind, and went, that's comfortable. All the damage that they'd done early with the breeze had virtually been taken away, and I think that gave us great confidence heading into the second quarter. Pretty dark, sort of, 
memory of it and something that I'm not proud of. If Dermy needs to come out and say that to make himself feel better, well, good on him. It's getting dark suddenly at VFL Park. Nervous start for West Coast. They kicked four goals then in seven minutes and then relinquished a good break with two goals to Dunstall. Will turned and, um, yeah, all of a sudden it was all hands on deck. In trouble hitting high tackle. Oh, oh. Free kick, Brereton. Dermot just rubbed his head into the turf a little. Not a lot. He did what you had to do. And if part of that was hurting somebody deliberately from the opposition, you did it. Lawrence, oh, gee, with the elbow. Excuse me. And he's in front, should Mark. Oh, must get a free oh, kick. Man. Getting worked over a few of these boys for the West Coast Eagles. At some stage, we've got to take on the big bully. Uh, and this is our this is our moment, this is our time. We've got to take these boys on. It's a fight on in mid-square. St Jenkins in the centre square, this is going on. And Brereton's also getting involved with McKenna and Main Waring. Chris Lewis getting heavily involved with Ray Jenke. Back in those days, you know, racial vilification. Gee, I don't think the two words had ever been used together. So we went and gave it to Chris Lewis. And I reckon that boiled over. Oh, look, it cut pretty deep. Yeah. Oh, I said I was only a young boy trying to go out and do what I did best, and I'd never really experienced any of that sort of stuff until I played AFL. Chris Lewis's greatest strength was his ability to cope with, with that type of pressure, which was the norm in those days. Absolutely disgraceful. I don't think errors have anything to do with it. Black Sea and all this sort of stuff. The crowd were quite vocal in that sort of area, which was always a bit, um, a bit upsetting. Only now in this day and age do we understand what we've done. I've apologised to Chris Lewis since. Pretty dark sort of memory of it and something that I'm not proud of. If Dermy needs to come out and say that to make himself feel better, well, good on him. Probably a recognition and a, an admission of a bloke that's fair dinkum about understanding what, what he may have done in the past and trying to right or wrong. Chris was reported on a couple of occasions. In my mind, I have no doubt that he was vilified. After getting suspended and not being able to play because of retaliating and all that sort of stuff, you, you just sort of learn to put up with it. We accepted it. And we, we've got a lot to pay for that as a nation, as a, as a, as a league and as individuals. We was a little bit disappointed that we probably didn't, as a club, push the issue a bit further. But I think it was one of those areas that we all didn't want to go to because it was a bit prickly. Football wore him down. And from a young man, when I first went to that football club, a big, beautiful big smile, that become more and more tested through his career and more the shame. We look back now and sort of wonder, well, how did that happen? Just thank God we've improved as a sport. Hawthorne with the breeze. Final term this one. Brennan favours the outer side. Perhaps a chance of rain. Via again plays on. 45 metres out from goal. This could be a lift up. It's a goal. A point the difference there at BFL Park in the grand final. As I said earlier, this man is the man they're going to tr have trouble containing his. There's a point in the game where you break the opposition, so you just got to keep going and going until that happens. 55 metres, drop punt. Gee, he's kicked it well, he's kicked the goal. Hawks in front, they've kicked four goals in about four minutes here, Hawthorne. And so the Hawks are making their move on this grand final now. We kick one or two, and then they start to doubt themselves. Deer again. Good kick to Hudson. Suddenly there are holes everywhere for Hawthorne players to run into. It was like the little boy trying to poke the holes in the in the dike. They were just opening up everywhere. He's kicked 60 goals this year. He's averaged two and a half a match. And he's kicked that one straight through. Well, they're now starting to get their act together, Hawthorne. And we started to beat individuals across the ground. Hawthorne had played in many finals, understood the caper, understood not to panic. Now we're in that situation, and, and what do we do about it? Very clean, good kick too. It was a hot one, and Sumich controlled it well. Well, in the context of the afternoon, this could well be the most important kick we've seen so far. From 35, good kick. 
don't get anything given to you. Like, as much as our, our, our year was great, they weren't going to just give us the cup. We were starting to seriously feel the pressure, but we knew that we weren't going to crumble. Bangs at the Lewis, should take this. Drop punch, he's kicked that all right. Straight through the middle for another one. Well, they're right back in this, West Coast. This quarter, panning out a little like the first. It was Hawthorne who came back in the latter part of the first quarter. Now West Coast are doing exactly the same thing. Well, you don't qualify on top if you haven't got any guts, and they're showing it now, the West Coast Eagles. The momentum had, had shifted. I, I guess we were hanging tough. Players generally have a good perception for the momentum or the you know, which team's really got true control of the game, regardless of the scoreboard. And there it is. So at half time, the Hawks by 10 points. But West Coast well and truly in this game. Maybe taking the finger off the pulse a little bit towards the end of the quarter. And they'd thrown the kitchen sink at us. They should have been, they should have been about five or six up. And now, please welcome Australia's famous marathon champion, Rob DiCostella. Accompanied by one of the patrons of the Paralympics, Angry Anderson. We trotted out Angry in the Batmobile. That may just leave a little bit to be desired in hindsight. Angry Anderson doing his tunes in the back of the car. Life's tough, so what? I'm alive. The idea of the Batmobile, and I guess we all grew up with Batman and Robin anyway, so I don't know where Robin was on the day. But... I, I don't mind Angry Anderson. I don't know about the Batmobile. I certainly don't put it in super slow-mo. <laughs> Angry Anderson, you can't help but be scarred by that experience. Thank you, Melbourne! I suppose we were the lucky ones because we were downstairs in the room, didn't have to watch it. <laughs> you run back out and you go, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> You've got no idea. And then when you look back at it on the replays, you go, what the hell was that? <laughs> I went berserk a little bit at the player group. It's sad. Real sad. Pulse of Perth is throbbing. The streets are virtually deserted. The Eagles supporters here have found their voices again. Can they win it? Like Angry said, we're bound for glory. Despite perhaps on the scoreboard being in the game at half time, I think there was a general feeling amongst the group that we, we hadn't played our best footy. I remember coming in and most of the players were pretty down. It was like we were gone. They're only 10 points up, but we were gone. I went berserk a little bit at the player group. We were right in this game and I was yelling and screaming a bit and boys, get your head up, you know, we're right in this, we're kicking with a breeze. That's probably what we needed. He summed it up right. We probably did have a head down and we were only 10 points out of the game. It was sad, really, at, at the time, because it shouldn't have happened. The Hawks coming out onto the ground now for the second half. I was quietly confident that if we could string some goals together, that then the pressure would start mounting on West Coast. Goes for distance towards the pocket. Brereton. Great grab. What can the champ do? From 35 metres out, stabs and kicks truly. I went to kick it, and even the rosin on my right hand, the ball stuck. And instead of dropping the ball straight down like that, it fell like on an obtuse angle. It hit, and I looked at it go away, and I went, that's out in the full. And it went for a goal, and I thought, geez, if I'm kicking them that bad and they're going for goals, we're in for a reasonable day here. And Dunstall ran out to me as I was running back down, and he looked at me, and I remember his look, and it was exactly this, he went, oh. And I went. Hudson, the handball to Morrissey. Left foot, he can kick this. He has put it through. Bit of a worry with Lockyer playing on the forward line. Lewis cleverly to Eddie. Eddie with a high one to the goal square. Oh, gee, is that a goal? I think it might be. It is. 
We had to have a big third quarter and, and get some scoreboard damage. Goal for goal in, in that third quarter where it shouldn't have been into that breeze. I felt really good about the fact it was goal for goal. That suited us. We knew we were kicking into a breeze. Sermich back towards half forward. All Hawthorne, three against one. But the one is Henny and he's all class. But Ayers is too good. Only man to win the Norman Smith twice. Gary Ayers' hair was longer than his wife's. <laughs> And she had long hair. It grew that long there at one stage that the top part of the seven you wouldn't see, so it looked like a one on an angle. Wouldn't I love to have my mullet from the 90s? As a team, we had the best group of mullets ever seen, bar none. The mullets? Mm. Uh, I won't mention any names, but Camper Matura spring to mind first. <laughs> the boys used to call them the fellas, the fellas out the back, and Pritch had some good fellas. Of empty spaces across the forward line. Oh, Ayers, well played. Wilson still with him, though. A ball to be won. Ayers with strength. Out of all the things that I achieved in footy, one of the special moments was uh, being named number one in Hawthorne's Hall of Fame in relation to mullets. <laughs> when you look back, you think, oh my God, they're not good, but I'd give anything for a mullet right now. Dear cleverly with strength to Anderson. Oh, great kick for a goal. Look at that one. A beauty. 12 15 11 5. Going goal for goal at BFL Park. This is Pike 60 metres out. Long bomb. Eddie is going back. Not required. It's a goal. What a grand final. The two heavyweights in the competition are slugging it out. If you've got the wind, you go, you've got to make hay while the sun shines. If you haven't got it, defend like anything. We needed to be in front by two or three goals at three-quarter time. Training by 17 points. Kick one from the other pocket a moment ago. This one's tougher. Drop punt, leans over it. Looks to have kicked it very well. Has. And the Eagles come again. They will not lie down. And dear at this stage, here's Lewis. Still Lewis for goal. He's done it. He's kicked his second. And suddenly, West Coast are back within five points. Deer gives it away beautifully. Condon should kick it easily. They've answered again, the Hawks, 10-15 to 10-4. Not a good sign for West Coast that Hawthorne could respond so quickly. There will be no further score in this third quarter. It goes now. So the scene is set. The stage has been constructed for the final term. Ten points down, still thought that was still a chance. We had pretty much given all that we could to three-quarter time. For that next 30 minutes, I was in for my biggest lesson in, in footy, I reckon, and that's that's where I learned all about experience. Three-quarter time was just for getting a drink. I honestly thought we'd run over. Mayne Waring, who's had a very good third quarter. Tried hard, hasn't he, Chris Mayne Waring? He was a gutsy person. He threw his body in so many times into a battle, into a contest. He just had a big heart. But the loss of Maney, it leaves a hole that will never be filled. The West Australian football community came together today to farewell former Eagle Chris Mainwaring. The 41-year-old died last week. The man who was revered by family, friends and fans. I can't say enough about Chris and we're all, we're all poorer for his passing. Maney was loved by everyone. Um, he, he never had a bad word to say about anyone. It's not hard to reflect on Maney in a positive way because of the great memories that he shared with us. He was such a driver of our team spirit. I love Chris Maywery. He was a scallywag. He was just, he was the life in many respects of their football club. People loved to be around him, had a great energy. What he taught us was, you know, how much you had to give and how much you needed to sacrifice to be the best you could be. I'll be honest, it still, still hurts today. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sad, real sad. He's a good mate, always will be, and um, it's all he missed. Grand final, 10 points the margin, but Hawthorne coming home with the breeze. Alan Joyce, very brief, spoken to his players and has left the ground. You talk to players at three quarter time, the confidence I had in them and they had in their own ability was quite enormous. Joyce was very intense. 
you know, and it's what we needed at that time was that, that intensity and, and he certainly brought that along. He was your straight shooter, very serious, stay focused, get the job done. Winning wasn't, uh, wasn't expected at Hawthorne, it was demanded. As a coach, it, uh, I found it very difficult. Michael Malthouse talking with his charges, asking for one desperate final quarter. As a coach, you, you, you generate as much enthusiasm as you can and as much passion, and um, yes, we can, but deep down, I thought that we are really up against it. He was a hard coach. He didn't let anyone get away with anything. If we made blues, we were going to have to answer for them. But he hated blokes who gave up. Hard taskmaster and pretty un unforgiving. In mixed mind, it was combat. So Pritchard with the first kick. Tier again, who's been superb all day, goes for goal and touched by Dunstall. The man they've been unable to stop, Deer. He played great. He jumped into packs and he bowled blokes over. He took big marks and he came of age. You are pumped and you just want to do everything right for your teammates. Deer again gives his chances up forward to Pritchard. Well, Deer's just killed him, hasn't he? He's been fantastic. We're always waiting for Paul to actually come to the, the, the big stage, if you like, put on a display. Did we see that game coming? No, it was a crack. Lawrence has kicked the full forward. Deer goes in and Brera's on the front spot. One of the most celebrated careers in the history of the game. And from point blank range, should not miss and puts it through for number three. And now it's up to the west coast at 94 to 77. Pedal your bike to the top of the hill. It's hard, hard work. But then you roll down the other side. Exhibition here. Sells a dummy. After that first five minutes, we were rolling down the other side. West coast was shouting. It's taken by Pritchard. This for a premiership, perhaps it's home. No one right on the line. It's been marked by Brereton. Well, the avalanche is gaining momentum now. Kicks. It's a goal. And perhaps it's the end of a dream now for the West Coast Eagles. Well, that's when I came to, to realise what experience was all about, because those boys, they knew. They knew they could go to another level. And they decided to hit the turbo button, and they stood up and they went for it, and we couldn't go with them. It was just happening very quickly. Uh, you know, it was as much a battle of survival of anything. If your perception, especially in a grand final, is we can't get this back quite often, the floodgates do open. You only need to see one bloke drop his head, one bloke put his hands on his hips. As an opposition, you sense that, and it's time to go in for the kill. And I reckon that's exactly what we did. Gowers goes to half forward. Tia, who's been a colossus today, to Condon. Condon towards the goal square. Hudson. Drop punt, goal. And in the space of five minutes, Hawthorne has kicked three goals. Shut the gate, well, just about. That we weren't going to be premiers in 1991 was, was what starts to go through your mind. The biggest disappointment was that we deserted each other when we needed to stand up and, you know, have a real crack at it, which was unlike our footy club. We felt we had a massive mortgage on it. Fair to say we had one hand on it. We just couldn't get the other one on. Behind Hudson, here to be taken high, gets it to Dunstall, 15 metres out, Dunstall takes another one. There is a tipping point in grand finals. Once you get past that tipping point, it's almost like maybe there's nothing to play for towards the end of a game. You drift off from actually uh, fighting the game out like you, uh, you may do in a home and away game when you know there's next week. But in a grand final, it's, well, what's there to gain in these last 10 minutes or 15 minutes. I had to learn to play in grand finals of that magnitude and the pressure that was on in that grand final, uh, they just started to, to virtually wilt. If you win a game, you've got a thousand fathers and if you lose, it's, you're an orphan. The buck stops fair and square with the coach. Dunstall has the drop, he goes back in front, Brennan's fallen over, Dunstall deep in the pocket. Measures the options, pulls it back, it's a goal! Oh, what a classic! Well, it's a celebration now. He basically just pivoted and just snapped that across his body. I knew then that we'd won another premiership. You know, all of a sudden you're running on air and they've all of a sudden got some men in their boots. I remember looking at the clock 
about 10 or 11 minute mark and then I thought, blow the siren, we've got them. Hawthorne charging away to their ninth premiership, all since 61 and eight of them now since 71. We knew how to get to a grand final, we knew, knew how to be competitive for three quarters. We didn't know yet what it took to go all the way. One of the big differences between the two sides was belief. I think we'd been there, we knew we could do it. They wanted to do it, but they hadn't done it yet. Tuck. Bangs it back. It's going to break all the records today, Tucky. To Brereton, to Mew. Some of the most famous names in this famous club. To Dunstall. Just outside, Dunstall leans back, kicks it straight through. Smiles all round. That's correct. 1991 is the year of the Hawks. You are scarred for life. I find that very traumatic, um, you know, as a person. And I think success comes without comfort. Alan Joyce is coming down from his coaching box now. This game is in the bank. And yet another premiership goes to Glen Ferry. As the siren goes now and the Hawks win. Relief. No other word. Hawthorne winning 13 out of the last 14. Look at Joyce and Ayers together. Yeah, they brought himself halfway through the year, and we certainly showed him today, mate. It's not bad for a bunch of old hacks. A drug that costs you nothing. It's the exuberance, it's exhilarating, it's the greatest high you can have from a sporting perspective. You've got this combination of physical and mental exhaustion, and so there's a huge sense of relief. A huge sense of relief. It is this surreal thing, and time just doesn't exist. Just let's bear a thought for those West Coast. There's not a worse feeling in football than a run second. You might as well not have played the whole season. It's a shocking feeling. If you're going to lose a grand final, it's probably better not to be in one. That siren, you can all, I can feel it now almost in my toes, you know, my toes to my head. It's a spine chilling siren because you know, we just, you weren't good enough on that day. You do experience a sense of grief. We're mourning for that, that goal that we hadn't been able to realise. We had the weight of a state, the anticipation of, are we going to do it? And then when we didn't, it was gut-wrenching. For me, I was dirty. I was dirty on a few of my teammates. Wasn't, you know, walking around sulking. Um, I, I just got angry that this shouldn't have happened. The only word that comes to mind is hollow. You just hollowed out. Uh, and it takes a long time to ever recover from that. Maybe you never fully recover from it. I don't think you do. You win a grand final, you're part of history forever. You lose a grand final, you are scarred for life. And that's great to see Dermot Brereton talking with Ashley McIntosh, no doubt realising what a fine young player he's going to be. If there's such a thing as crying without tears, that was him. And I remember put my arm around him, put my hand on his chest and trying to console him. Don't be remembered just as somebody who played well in a grand final but never won one. Keep going until you win one. There's Tucky, seven premierships. And I think he played 50 reserves games and he's played 426. I was aware that that game could have been the end of Michael Tuck's career. I just shook his hand and said, congratulations and thank you. I think we all thought he could probably play with about 50. <laughs> Unbelievable player, unbelievable competitor. He's just a superstar, really, when you think about it. It just seemed to be the perfect moment, I think, to drop the curtain on what had been an unparalleled career. Go out holding the Premiership Cup. If you are writing the script, well, that's it. To the players of the Hawthorne Football Club, you are magnificent today, and thank you to all the Hawthorne supporters. Thank you. Michael Tuck, 38 finals. And yet another winning one. When will he stop? The decision was made after the 91 grand final that, you know, Michael's days were finished and he had to be told. And whether he liked it or not, unfortunately, it became a personal thing. And, you know, we did uh, communicate greatly for years. The winner of the Norm Smith medal, Paul Deere of Hawthorne. What can I say? It's just a dream come true. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
was sort of a surreal moment. I got nicknamed Normie from then on, so. I remember looking up and, and seeing Dipper, you know, in the grandstands and how much he would have loved to have been out there. Dipper and I, I don't know if he remembers it, before the game he put his arm around me, he said, I wish I could play, and he was dirty, and he said, uh, go in there, play one for me. And I just held it and said, for birdie. The Hawks begin their lap. The Eagles will look to 1992. Their first grand final, we knew that, that, that you know, they were going to win one. Just glad it wasn't that one. Paul Hudson. I'm sure there'd be no prouder person than his father, Peter. Back into the rooms and seeing your family was a big buzz for me. And then reflecting back on Dad having played in 71 and myself in 91. Yep, that's one all, so I hope there's a lot, but hopefully there's a lot more to come. I would hate to think what, uh, what life would have been like if I hadn't have played in that grand final. Absolute euphoria. The kind of euphoria that you feel when your own child is born or you get married. And uh, the feeling now after such a long season? Oh, oh euphorious. <laughs> what? <laughs> euphorious, you happy with that? <laughs> you better translate it for these folks. I think it's, it's given me respect for how lucky I was to be a part of what was a sensational era. You know, the seven grand finals in a row, that's, that's something pretty special. I feel a bit uh, sorry for Eagles. You know, they were the best team throughout the year for sure, but uh, they weren't the best team in the finals. So uh, they'll learn from that and they'll probably be the side to beat next year. What I learned from that year was we were the best team between April and August. We weren't the best team in September. So, it's a waste. And I think success comes without comfort. So sometimes you've got, to, you've got to mold yourself around the heartbreak and see what effect that has on the character of people. Your biggest setbacks in life can become your greatest drivers and your greatest opportunities. I think the bond of, of, of losing sometimes tightens you as much as winning. And I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade that loss. If, if someone had said to me, how hard was a, a grand final loss to take? Well, I played in a grand final. I live a few streets away from the MCG and I work here as a guide, which I love. I don't go a lot to games. I go to very few games. I haven't been for a long time, but I dream about footy probably once or twice a week. Uh, and I find that very traumatic, um, you know, as a person. I've tried to get it out of my system. That's part of the hangover of, you know, coaching at that sort of level and the pressure. When the curtain comes down, it's a pretty lonely world out there. Yeah, if I could click my fingers, the one thing I'd do right now is be able to play footy again. That's the one thing I'd change in my life, just to be able to play footy again. Some great players never got the chance, never played in grand finals, never, never sniffed a premiership. If you sniff an opportunity, by George, you better, you better take it. But it's a day that belongs to the Hawks. And this crowd paying them the tribute they so richly deserve. <laughs>